born in the police state of South Africa and immigrated to California after winning a green card in the lottery in 2008. She moved from New York City to New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project and uh, is really involved in spearheading and building a great movement and running two major events of her own. I don't know how she does it. Pork Fest, which I mentioned had 1,600 people, which was just last week, and the New Hampshire Liberty Forum, which had 350 people. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carla. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I think I'm mic'd here, so I'm going to walk around because none of my technology works because I run everything on Linux, and we're still building that bridge for those things. So thank you for that lovely introduction, and thank you so much for having us here. I actually think there's a wonderful synergy that can happen between the objectivist, open objectivist movement and the FSP. In order to establish my street creds in this crowd a little bit, um, I should tell you my dad is actually a Randian and he turned me on to Atlas Shrugged when I was, I guess I was 16, I just started law school, which sounds ridiculous, but it's a true story. So. Um, I finished high school when I was very young and went to law school straight out of high school, which is how it works in South Africa. And he was like, you know what? You should read this book. And I remember just being like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. There's someone in the world who thinks the way I think. I'm also someone who's not really a huge fan of labels. I like to just think of us all as humans. And so, you know, Aaron and I talk about this when we have our monthly objectivist meeting, he's like, come over, come over. And I'm like, well, that's a little hard for me. Like right now, you know, I just want to say, you know, I'm a person and I believe in a philosophy of liberty and personal responsibility and um, peace and prosperity, I guess. Um, so first of all, the question isn't who is John Galt? The question is, where is John Galt? And I will tell you where he is. He is in New Hampshire, of all the possible places he could be, that's where he is. So what is the Free State Project? The Free State Project is a movement to attract 20,000 people to the state of New Hampshire. How did we come up with that number? It was a thumb suck. So the history is that there was this gentleman called Jason Sarans. He was at Yale at the time. And he was really frustrated by the libertarian presence in the elections and how things go. And he, you know, being an academic, kind of scratched his head and he thought, is there a solution to this problem? And he was like, what would happen if we put a bunch of people who think the same way in one place, i.e. we concentrate us together and see what we can get done? Because one of the frustrations, and I'm sure this is the case for many of you, is just, hey, we have the best idea, but no one will listen to us, and we can't get anything done. So he wrote the paper, he put it up on a small academic libertarian journal, and um, it blew up. People were just like, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, we should totally do that. Let's all go to one place and let's build, you know, in air quotes, Galt's Gulch. So people will ask, why New Hampshire? And there are several reasons for that. And you can go to our website and look up at freestateproject.org. We have 101 reasons listed. Amongst them are fun things like, oh, you might not get shot buy a cop if you buy raw milk voluntarily from someone else. Because in many states, and I'm sure people here have seen the videos, if you want to buy raw milk, something not sanctioned by the government, they will come and arrest you, or if you run a farm stand, they will come and they will shut you down. So raw milk is one of the reasons, but there are more important reasons, mostly because New Hampshire has an existing culture of liberty. People looked at various different states and gave folks the opportunity to vote on where they want to go. They looked at Alaska, they looked at Wyoming, they looked at um, several, you know, the Dakotas, and with all due respect to anyone who's here from the Dakotas, I'm like, man, that's, that's really remote. I mean, one of the things that is appealing about New Hampshire is that it is 
in the Northeast. It is accessible to you know, Boston. There are direct flights out of Manchester that are international. So, so there are pluses on that side. Um, New Hampshire is also chronically voted the freest state in America. There are various metrics. Um, the study is usually done by Mercatus. Forbes came out with a study which said it was you know, the safest place to live. Weird how that works, right? It's also one of the places with the highest gun, personal gun ownership in America, yet it's the, one of the safest places. And that's something that'll you know, blow people, probably not in this room's mind, but certainly you know, if people are watching this later online, it's, you know, it's, it's unfathomable. When I was a city girl and I went out to New Hampshire for the first time for one of our signature events, the Porcupine Freedom Festival, and this was years ago, this was probably like eight years ago, there were 100 people there. So we have grown from 100 people, of which 97 were men. There were three chicks. All the guys had like long beards and they were carrying guns, and I was like, WDF, <laughs> like what is going on here? And, but I was just so enamored and so drawn to the ideas of liberty that I was like, yeah, okay, maybe we can you know, shift the culture a little. Let's make this a little hipper. Let's make it a little cooler. And um, New Hampshire also has one of the largest uh, state legislatures in the English speaking world. So there are 400 state reps and they represent about 3,000 people, so they know you. You know your neighbor, and if that guy goes and he votes for something that you don't like, you know whose door to knock on and to say, excuse me, sir, like, what are you doing? No, I don't wanna pay that extra tax, or I don't wanna do this other thing. So, um, we have really easy access to politics, and that's a great thing because you know, we, we have an approach where we're just trying to draw people into the state to say, let's create something that can become the beacon of liberty for the rest of the world to emulate. So currently, so the Free State Project's goal, is that my heart beating or do I keep knocking something? <laughs> I'm knocking something? All right, I won't touch, I won't touch my boobs. Um, so um, we have, I think it is my heart. <laughs> I have a heart. Should I go on to this mic? Would that be better? Yeah? All right, let me do that. Sorry, guys. I'm like the worst tech person. All right, switch this one off. And I'm on this one. All set? All right. So um, the way it works is we have about, we're trying to get 20,000 people to move. We're at 14,300. We've been accelerating at an alarming rate. I like to think my heartbeat and my boobs have something to do with that, but I might be wrong. Um, we have, the way it works is we're supposed to get 20,000 people to sign up. And then once that happens, people have five years to move. And a lot of us were like, you know what? We're not gonna wait. Let's just, this is a great idea. It's an awesome place to live. Why won't we just start to go anyway? So about 1,200 of us have just said, yep, we're moving, and we have. And so with what is a small number of that 20,000, I'll tell you in a little bit about some of the really great things we've been able to achieve. So we currently have 14,300 signers we got about 100 extra signers at Porkfest, which I'll talk about in a little bit as well. We have thousands of friends in the state. So those are friends of the free state. And there are those locals, those natives, that were part of the reason why we chose to move there. Um, historically, over the past, I would say, six years, we've, um, and I should say not we, but free state participants, people who have moved, have run for office. We had, um, two years ago, we had 15 state reps. This year, when it switched from Republican to Democrat, or last year, I guess, um, we still have 12 free staters in the state house. So that, to me, is sort of a status quo situation, and it's almost a, it's 
I think an endorsement of our ideas, it means we chose the right state, we're doing the right things, because the number didn't really shift that significantly, which means people like the ideas of liberty. We also have people who run on um, state and local boards, school boards, any treasury, you know, anything where you can kind of go and just, you know, either gridlock or grind the wheels or help get something passed or, you know, various levels of local government. Um, we're pretty popular on social media. For those of you who, who do follow social media, I would highly recommend. Like our page on Facebook. We have about, I guess, uh, 27,000 fans at this stage and we have about 35,000 fans for um, our Twitter. It's a good way just to stay in touch with us, to know what we're doing and what's going on. So participants who have moved, and as Erin said, you know, we've been trying to get 501c3 for a long time. We actually, in fact, abandoned the original um, application and then reintroduced it a couple of years ago because I have big plans and big plans take deep pockets, you know, and you want to not give taxes to the state, or I don't want to, and I hope people who would support these ideas don't really want to. Um, so we've been doing things, so, so, I'm, I, so what I, the reason I brought that up is so, I'm just the bus driver. My job is just to bring people to New Hampshire, and once you're there, what you do is up to you, right? So individual participants have been working, I would say, for the most part on three different levels. They've been working or using the system, so that's sort of the political arm. Uh, we have a strong civil disobedience outside the system, participants who are involved with that. And then the one that I'm the most interested in is um, sort of the free market or the agora, let's bring businesses, let's, let's create something new and exciting and that sort of um, Gulchy idea, I'm sure you can get crucified for that one. <laughs> so, in terms of um, using the system, or um, we have the NHLA, and actually, I, I believe Eileen is here, she's back there in the corner, so you definitely go talk to her. The NHLA is the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. They are a CPAC, they are the people who will, um, you know, help to get people elected. Uh, you know, there are challenges when freedom is messy, right? So there are challenges when you bring a sea of people together. People have differing ideas about what the right tactic is. People have differing ideas about whether it should be political or outside the system or how does it work when we do businesses. But they do a really great job of getting the right candidates, seeding them into races, and helping them win. Um, they also do an annual rating of candidates where they um, say this person's you know an A plus liberty candidate and this person sucks and they're an F you know and the interesting thing is within the state you actually start to see them um, the, the reps respond to that they it's it's a report card for them to go what no one likes me but i have voted for all this taxi stuff and it's like yeah you know what people don't like that we don't like having other people's hands in our pockets so within the system we've had several successes um we've we've also had fun one instance in the last race is we ran a not we a the nhla ran a um it was a democrat candidate and a Republican candidate on the same ticket, and they were both free staters. So it was like, win-win, you know? And I would love to see more of that. That's one of the reasons I really want to see us trigger the move. The more people we can get in, the more fun we can have. And I'm sure there are people here who love politics, but I'm just like, yawn. Because it's so hard. It's just, you know, you're constantly hitting your head against you know, problems and, and incrementalism and all of those things. So it's really fun when you can bring people in and you can just say, well, no matter what, someone who believes in liberty is going to win. Uh, we fought the National ID Act and pushed that back. That was really great. In the last session, uh, before it turned to, to blue, 
We uh, cut the budget by one billion, with a B, dollars. That was 12% of the budget that was actually cut, not like BS cuts, real cuts. Um, we introduced the Castle Doctrine, which expanded um, stand your ground from your house to anywhere where you have a right to be. You are allowed to protect yourself in self-defense. Um, the, the Democrats actually tried to get that reversed in this session and they couldn't push it through, which will tell you something about the nature of the people within the state because you know, even the Dems were like, no, this is actually not a bad law. We should, you know, we should keep it. Um, the one I'm most excited about as a recovering lawyer, <laughs> it's been 10 years and seven months <laughs> and six days since my last <laughs> lawyering, <laughs> um, was jury nullification. So uh, probably most people are familiar with what that is, but it's basically your right as a jury to say even though, yes, you broke the law, that's a stupid law. I mean, that's the shortest way to explain it. It was something that was used a lot in prohibition, you know, when people were like, but we all really do drink that gin, you know? And so they stopped arresting people and we had a case in New Hampshire and it was all happenstance because the, the population of the state is fairly small. So there was this guy, he's a, he's a white Rastafarian who lived out in, you know, bum city somewhere, and he had uh, 32 plants in his backyard, and there was a Coast Guard helicopter that flew over. So first of all, it's like, why are they flying over farms and lands in New Hampshire? Spotted something that he thought looked fishy, let the local guys know, the local guys came, they raided him, he was like, yeah, this is my religion and I'm gonna fight this. Took two, three years, he just kept fighting, kept fighting. The morning of his case, they were like, well just, let's just make this go away. You know, they were like, oh, okay, you know, um, we'll just say, um, plead out, no time served, misdemeanor, two, second degree misdemeanor, like really just nothing. And he was like, no. This is my principle, this is my religion. I think I should be able to smoke a plant if I want to. What gives you the right? I'm going to trial. So he goes to trial and guess who's on the jury? A free stater. So she's like a 65 year old retired school teacher from Texas. She moved out about five years ago. Um, they argue because we've passed a law in New Hampshire, which is the only state in, um, in America. I don't like to say a state in the union. I just like to say in America. So <laughs> they, um, we, we passed a law in New Hampshire that says, not only do you have, um, not o so, sorry, I'm muddling this, but so there is a right to jury nullification. No one ever tells the jury. And the judge, if you push him, will let you, you know, will do some kind of instructions, but they're always very hard to understand and don't make a lot of sense, and the jury doesn't really know what their, their freedom and what their duty is. So um, in this case, they did argue jury nullification. The defense attorney was allowed to introduce that, and when they walked into the deliberation room, when the jury got there, it wasn't this lady who even brought it up. It was another juror who immediately said, well, what's this jury nullification thing? And she was able to explain to him what it meant, and the jury came to a unanimous decision that this guy should not even have anything on his record, so it's a good thing he didn't take the plea because he wasn't found guilty of anything, which is how it should be. Um, so that's one of the successes we've had on the political front. For people working outside the system, um, civil disobedience, I personally believe, and I hope some people here believe, but you know, we're all entitled to our opinion, is a really powerful way to shine the light on the force of the state. Because the state ultimately is force. 
We should all believe in a world where you say, I am free as a person to voluntarily trade with you, contract with you, but to make people do something because I say so, I, the state, say so, is, in my opinion, not great. So I have a lot of respect for the people who do civil disobedience. Um, they do everything from the 420 celebrations through to um, wiretapping. Although technically wiretapping is not illegal, I personally got arrested for this a few years ago. Oh, for like, like a freak show. Like I know sometimes when I go to a rally or I go to a protest or I'm going somewhere where we're trying to get a message across or push the boundaries that something might happen and I'll prepare for that accordingly. This was, I was driving home. I was, actually I wasn't driving home. I was driving to a friend's house and I had my season pass skis because New Hampshire's great for northeastern skiing, but if you come from Tahoe, yes, I agree, it's better there. But um, great skiing, and um, driving, driving to a friend's house so I could sleep over and drop my skis off the next day. So we were two cars following each other. We were going probably a little over the speed limit because these are small back roads and they drop from you know 50 to like 35 when you get into town, but we were definitely braking, we were slowing down. Cop comes from the front, whoop, whoop, turns around, pulls us over, and pulls in between our two cars and tells me I should leave. And I'm like, well, actually, I don't know where I'm going, so I'm just gonna hang around. Cop seemed weird, kind of hopped up. I wasn't sure what was going on. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna take out my camera and just record it. Because if you can bear witness through technology, which is one of the reasons I believe we're winning is because of technology. You know, we are living in the Gutenberg Press 2.0 period of our lives. Information is spreading at a alarming and beautiful rate. You know, when someone like Hillary Clinton says, we've lost the information war, I know we're winning. So I was like, oh, I'm just gonna record them. They didn't really like that. I might have been a little mouthy. Oh, uh, <laughs> long story short, they dropped all the charges against me. Being a recovering attorney, I was like, screw you guys, I'm gonna sue the pants off you. So we have a 32 charge uh, in federal court in Boston uh, for violations of my civil rights, including the fact that they argue you have no right to film public officials on public duty while executing their public, you know, responsibilities. And I'm like, really? We don't have a right to do that? Because I'm pretty sure we do. So also on the civil disobedience side, um, and, and I was sort of inspired by, and these were free staters who started Coplock. It's, um, it's a website, it's well worth checking out. It's all about police accountability. Um, in Manchester, where I live, we sort of started a little softer one based on ideas that came out of a, a group in Texas, and it's called Peaceful Streets. And what we'll do is uh, go out in New Hampshire, <laughs> New Hampshire is so awesome. That's really all I have to say. But uh, it's also very quaint. So they have to announce when they're gonna do a DUI checkpoint and they have to put it in the newspaper and they have to tell you where it is. This is like gold for activists, right? <laughs> We're like, yeah, it's you know midnight and it's 15 degrees outside, but let's go and we'll get lasers and uh, there's a guy who can do lasers and he'll put it up. Uh, you know, from blocks away, checkpoint up ahead, turn around if you don't want to go through it. And then, um, and then there'll be people with signs and they'll stand and they'll hold the signs and we'll just kind of warn people. Some people care, some don't. For me, well, okay, so, so to answer that question, her question was, will you put a tip jar? So this is my favorite activist story. So there were a bunch of people out, I wasn't there that night, but um, they had gone out and they had the signs up and apparently there was like a, a fairly large van-like vehicle and they had put it on the bridge and they had the signs up and these guys came rolling in, you know, they had some thumping music and 
they couldn't believe someone was warning them and they were like, thank you. And then they disappeared and then they drove around the block and they came back and they were like, can I give 20 bucks to every single person who's out here right now? Now, I don't know what was in that car. I mean, I have some guesses. Um, but I was like, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Then the third approach, so, so we have the political, and, and honestly, that's a lot of fun too. We have uh, George Lambert here today. He's a New Hampshire native who has sort of formed an alliance with people who are politically motivated and um, he's planning to run for governor. And, you know, and it's great to think, wow, we can actually get to that level. We've got state reps, we've got people thinking about running for governor. And by we, I mean people who believe in liberty and believe in more liberty in our lifetime. The one I personally am the most excited about is sort of the free markets, the businesses, the, um, the you know, just really creating that idea of Gold's Gulch 2.0. So, you know, originally people were sort of disappearing and escaping. I do think there is a mild sense of escape to move there for, for several reasons, mostly because you have a community, you have backup and all of those reasons. But I do think beyond sort of what the vision of Ayn Rand was, was we're trying to really say, Let's, let's, let's build, let's not only disappear, let's build it and let's integrate into a community of people who maybe have forgotten what they used to believe. I mean, there really is a, like a Yankee individualism, like a rugged, I'm 88 years old and I'm still doing my snow on my own kind of mentality out there. And, and, and it's beautiful to behold because, you know, you, you come to Mordor and with all due respect, I'm like, we should definitely move this to New Hampshire. <laughs> Who wants to come to DC? <laughs> this place is horrible. <laughs> You're just surrounded by statists. It's, it's shocking. <laughs> but um, so, so several people have bring, brought really successful businesses, everything from a couple, uh, a couple of brothers who moved from back from, is they had left America, gone to Israel, had come back to America, started a really high-end guitar store. We have Seiko CII, which is a really big um, uh, debt collector, but collects debts with respect. Um, the, the, the guys from Israel partnered with another free stater. They have created the first Bitcoin ATM. Um, I was the second person ever to use it at the International Students for Liberty conference. I was pretty psyched. <laughs> and, um, and then we also do things like private charities. So uh, we have a belief that the, the, the market should provide and that people should privately be able to interact. And there is a question, what happens when people fall on hard times or where, you know, things aren't going that well, how are we gonna deal with that without having a nanny state? And so you gotta live by your ideals. So we've introduced something called Shire Sharing and we feed 600 families over Thanksgiving, people who couldn't provide for themselves. Uh, there's, there are refugees in New Hampshire from Nepal. So we even do, um, custom menus for people who might not eat turkey or be like, what the hell is cranberry sauce, you know? And, um, and it's really a way for us to just show people that these ideas aren't just theoretical because I think that's where we are in terms of figuring out where do we go with these ideas. They've been around for a really long time and it's like, come on, really? Who's making inroads here in Mordor, in the Hell's Mouth, for anyone who's a Buffy fan? Um, it's just too hard. But what if we take all these brilliant minds and we take all these smart people and we put them together in a place where you know everyone who thinks the way you do and you have meetups every week. I mean, once a month we do the objectivist meeting. Um, uh, you know, we do, sorry, I jumped ahead there. Um, you know, we have uh, um, an MVP meeting, a Merrimack Valley porcupine meeting. And for those of you who don't know, it, 
our mascot for the Free State Project is the porcupine. And it's because it's a, it's a native creature of New Hampshire, but it's also an incredibly peaceful creature, but a little prickly. Like, you know, it just wants to be left alone. And I think that's sort of the sentiment that we have, you know? But there's something really charming and really innovative and really beautiful about bringing a bunch of prickly porcupines together and making something work and taking it from that, hey, we're all smart, we've all read all the books, you know, I mean, I, I, I can debate on monetary policy if I have to. I don't enjoy it as much as talking about the things I'm more passionate about, but it's a bunch of really smart people coming together and going, hey, we may not be able to change the world, but what if we change our world? What if we start here and we prickly porcupine together build this thing that actually works? So on the business side of things, the way I look at it, oh wait, I wanna share a porn story. Is anyone gonna be offended? <laughs> All right, so um, it's, it's not even a story, it's just an interesting factoid. And um, I didn't know this until uh, I, I, I met up with someone who, who was at Parkfest who understands the industry better than I do. And, because I don't understand the industry at all, just for the record. But um, she mentioned to me that there's this a big influx of businesses coming from California because California and New Hampshire were the only places where it was legal to film porn. But in California, they have now mandated by, you know, by law that the um, actors wear condoms. Now that seems like a smart idea, but people who are in the industry are actually, I mean, that's what they check for. They go to the doctor, you know, every week, you know, they're being checked for their STDs, whatever, their numbers, do you have this disease, whatever. And she's like, so people are starting to move there because they have a system, a voluntary, you know, self-regulated system that works and now they're being forced to wear condoms and apparently people don't like that in porn, I don't know, but um, so that's become a growth market. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I'm not calling out for all the porn stars to come to New Hampshire, but I just thought it was sort of an interesting example of how, you know, the, the laws of unintended consequences, which we all understand in this room, right? You're like, oh, I'm gonna fix this problem and make the world better. And then it's like, oh, wait, I just screwed everything up, you know, down the line. And so sort of taking that um, inclination away from people and that power away from people, because ultimately the, the uh, ultimately like what this is all about is there are people who want to control other people and there are people who just want everyone to live and let live. And that is our giant battle. I mean, that is really the, the philosophical thing, you know, what it boils down to is just, hey, if you wanna control other people by forcing them to do things they don't want to do, you're a sociopath. Sorry, mate. I mean, it's just that simple. You can't make people do things they don't want to do. It's not right, it's immoral. So with the business thing, the way I see sort of the future of New Hampshire is I would love to see us build the Yankee Hong Kong or the Yankee Switzerland, right? So a place where, and I actually gave part of this speech because I tend to ad lib a lot, I guess you guys can't tell, but um, when we did the Atlas Shrugged movie, premiere in, in Manchester, which was very well attended. There were over a hundred reps who had come. Um, Aaron, who couldn't be there, had asked me to speak. He always knows that's a risk. <laughs> but, um, you know, I got up and I just spoke from my heart and I said to the reps there, you know, let's not be so scared of freedom. Let's take the examples from across the world because once you look a little globally, you're like, oh, Portugal decriminalized uh, all drug use and drug use dropped in 10 years precipitously. 
oh, in Germany, where there are no speed limits on the Autobahn, there are less car accidents than when you have a speed limit of 55. Oh, in Macau, where you can gamble, or Monte Carlo, where you can gamble, you know, people gamble and they're not destitute and they're not, you know, on reservations and you know, being forced out of society and whatever. So it's what I would like to see us build is to say, let's take, let's take every good idea of a small slice of freedom from across the world and let's put them together and then go, well, you're not scared of that because they're doing it there and it's okay. So in the Netherlands, you know, people can smoke pot and it seems to still function. Oh, over here, people drive fast. And take all of those things and just say, what if we put them all together? What would that look like? And I like to think it would look like the Yankee Hong Kong. Um, I, I, you know, I, I might be proven wrong, but I'm pretty sure that if we really do build a place that is um, free and prosperous, and by with economic freedom comes all the other benefits, you know, we get we get rid of the the warfare state, and you know, I, I won't turn this into an anti-war speech, but I have strong opinions about that, and you know, I would just like to see us progress and really create a place where these ideas are implemented in a way where people can say, oh, you know what? This actually works. Now the interesting thing about New Hampshire too is once you bring all the prickly pears together <laughs> is everyone's like, no, my way is right. I'm, I'm, you know, I think we should just work politically. What are you civdis people doing? And, you know, who cares about the businesses? We should just smoke pot. Or, you know, so you bring all these, like, smart minds with these smart ideas together. And no one agrees. No one agrees on anything. And I'm pretty sure in this room, you know, we love to argue the nuances. You know, we'll take words, we'll pick them apart, we'll do all of those things. But I say it doesn't really matter whether we agree or not. It doesn't even matter if like my platform's the right one or whether what I've talked about works. We're arguing about tactics. If phil philosophically we agree, that we want liberty in our lifetime, which is what our motto is, then let's experiment. Let's create a marketplace of ideas, a marketplace of ideas, and come together and say, we don't know who's right, but if the Civ Disc guys are off there and the cops are going after them, maybe we can get some progress on the political front. And if um, you know, the political front is doing something, it's like, hey, maybe we can like convince people by going door to door to do this. Let's take that practical, let's take the theoretical and try to create a place where we can practically implement these ideas. And we don't have to agree on what the right implementation of those ideas are. I'm just saying, let's get in the laboratory. That's it, that's where you clap. <laughs> so the last things I wanna say is, my cards, my cards went out of order, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, so, so the awesome parts, um, all right, I got three more cards and then questions and we have someone up here already. So if you do have questions, please do come up. Um, how do I know we're winning? because some nasty republic, uh, no, she was a Democrat, some nasty Democrat who had moved to New Hampshire from Rhode Island in less time than I have spent in New Hampshire, I've been there longer, was like, oh my God, the free staters are the single biggest threat to the state today. And I was like, hash winning. I mean, I just, you know, it's like, yes, you know, what if, we, if we're starting to rile up the, the far left to the extent where they really want to call us out, we're doing it right. And I invite anyone who's here 
to one, come do it right with us. If you're skeptical but curious, we have two signature events that we do every year. The one is Liberty Forum. That'll be late January, early February. I have to go negotiate the contract after this because uh, freedom fighters' work is never done. Um, and then we have the Porcupine Freedom Festival, which um, is in the summertime where we had you know 1,600 people come out, spend a week together, bonfire of philosophizing, bouncing ideas, just really getting a sense for the community. And ultimately, that's what we're building. We're building a community from the ground up. We are talking about when you move in, I moved in 2008 in a blizzard in February. It was not the smartest time to move, but I was really eager to get out of Manhattan and just be like, I'm done. And my husband and I had our U-Haul and we kind of put out an ask and we're like, everyone claims someone's gonna come help you unpack. So, you know, we're showing up and it was, I mean, it was, a, you know, it was like a four footer, it was a genuine blizzard. And we were just like, yeah, okay, we'll just park the truck somewhere and maybe Monday we can figure something out. 20 people I have never met in my life showed up in that blizzard to come unpack my truck. And that's what it is. It's about saying, you know what? We don't have to be alone. We don't have to be like the freaks who are too smart or the freaks that no one understands. Or, you know, we, the, the marginalization that goes on, I think, with people who, who really understand, I mean, I hate to say the truth, but that's really what it is, right? Um, is, it can be debilitating. And so the, I encourage you, come to our two events. And really, if you're seeking a community, come, come find us. Um, I have a table outside. Come sign the statement of intent. If you don't want to do that, just come chat to me. And um, I say to Cynthia Chase, who was our detractor, this is how we responded to her. She gave us a 350% increase traffic on our website because of that statement. We were covered by Limbaugh and a bunch of you know, other big names. And what did we do? We sent her flowers. <laughs> so you know, that's what we're trying to do, is change hearts and minds, but do it in a playful, beautiful way. So I'm going to open it up to questions. Is this, oh, you would appear this is on now. I was reading in some pro-liberty New Hampshire uh, literature that, and I was hoping you could comment on it, the doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd, slavish, and destructive to the good and happiness of mankind. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yes, that would be Article 10 of the New Hampshire Constitution. And I love that the word slavish is in there. Because, you know, thank you, George. <laughs> yeah, I should put that in, actually. That's a good point. I had a PowerPoint. We just couldn't get the Linux to work with it. So I was just riffing a little work with me. Yes. Um, I don't want to be a broken record about education, but what is the free stater's take on the federally mandated federal, federal regulations coming down in education in New Hampshire? That's a, uh, that's a great question. It's something I often forget to talk about. We have a really, really robust homeschool and unschool community. Um, I don't pay as much attention to federal stuff as I probably should given my position, but honestly, I just, I don't give a crap. I just don't think we can fix it on a federal level. I'm just sorry. Like, I think we have to go back to the states and work our way up, you know, 10th Amendment Center, that kind of stuff. And we're actually seeing the states push back. I, I, I had a friend who moved to uh, Colorado the day before they passed the pot thing, and she didn't know that was even an option. And now she's like, yeah, I moved to a cooler place than you. You said you were so free. But there are small things within the states where people can push back. So. Uh, strong homeschooling community. We have a lot of charter schools. Um, one just opened down my street that I would say is like 40% free stater paid for, endorsed, teach at, help at. You know, we just did an ice cream social a couple of weeks ago. So 
federally, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not the right person to answer those questions because I, I, I just, I'm like, who cares about Mordor? Um, I, I think I might be in your target market. I'm currently <laughs> living in the city of brotherly love, the ah. sort of a welfare camp in areas. And I'm looking for a free state. And I'm just wondering, I'm hearing a lot of positives about a lot of different free states. I have a fondness for Texas, lack of a state income tax, easy inheritance taxes, quick probate, a lot of benefits, a lot of jobs. I know South Carolina protects the people in the state from Obamacare mm -hmm. in some way, they, that you can't be punished. That's really appealing to me right now. So I'm just wondering, you know, what is your package of really great benefits? You know, how can you really... Assuming there are lots of liberty-loving people everywhere, and there certainly are, what's your, you know, really big benefit to the free state shopper, <laughs> so <laughs> to speak? A, that's a great question. Just to get to the nut to of it, phrase the it. selfish um, reasons to go there. I mean, I think it's the community. I think also a plus is that we are actually attracting activists. Like, we're actually actively going out and trying to find the right shopper, and there's a platform there for you for whatever you're passionate about. If education's your passion or um, Obamacare rollback, and we've, we have been working on that as well, you can come and, and it's like, it sounds trite, but the way I've, I've explained it is, you know, it's, it's like InstaFriend. It's just add water, you know, or just add snow. Like there is a real robust community. We, we're all over the state, but we have large groups in Keene and Manchester and up in Grafton. Those places all have a little different flavor. Keene is more civil disobedience oriented. Manchester, where people don't really hear what we're doing because we all have day jobs and do this as well. Um, uh, Grafton is more almost the retirement village, you know, it's kind of where people go to really disappear. I would say come check it out. I'm not going to be, I can show you, but I can't probably legally tell you all the things that make all it right. awesome. Okay. It just, um, it really is the community ultimately. And, you know, I have a great fondness for the people out in Austin, Texas, who are trying to build Libertopia there. It's, um, they both signed as free staters. Um, so, you know, I, I think people realize it's not that easy. We've actually matured as an organization. We've been around for 10 years. We were just on the cover of Reason magazine. They were like, okay, you guys are legit. This is really happening. It's not Ecuador. It's not Costa Rica. It's not uh, uh, Uruguay or Paraguay. I mean, I looked at all of those options before I decided, okay, I'm going to go to New Hampshire, and I think we have to, if you want to stay in America and you want to be land-based and English-speaking, sorry, see stutters, um, then you, then New Hampshire, I believe, is your best option, and it's our best option if we all stand together for truly achieving liberty in our lifetime. Uh, a quick follow-up question. How long how much during the year do you have to live there to have it qualify as a residence? Is it like one day over six months or that, how does that, that work? That's a good question because <laughs> I, I, I oftentimes pitch people, especially uh, you know older people who don't want to come up for the cold or whatever. I'm like, buy a house and just vote there. You know, we can, you know, so, we can so do it's that. six months or more. I think it's, uh, do, do you know, George? I can tell you my question. Okay. I think it's, one day, I mean, did you say? I, I, I go classical in this sense because um, in, in common law, it's about your, where's your domicile, is um, the home is where the heart is, which was something different to what legislator, you know, what laws say. Uh, I have a copy of the New Hampshire Constitution here. All right, thank you. Yes. Um, it suggests that domicile is uh, where you are on election day. Oh, which wonderful. means that if you were to actually come in vacation with us, um, does, it, does, it, does it really say that? Oh because, yeah. Oh, I'm gonna pitch the crap out of that. Oh, absolutely. Be like, we we we'll just throw like events on election day. Uh, I would highly recommend that you know people look into it. Uh, domicile actually is uh, a more interesting and complicated topic. Our friends in the um, Democratic Party have 
uh, encourage some of their folks to, you know, domicile, I don't know, the morning of an election on a bus over the state line? Um, though, you know, there's some questions about that, and we can talk about voter fraud in the hall if you'd like. Um, but uh, under the ruling of um, our Attorney General, um, if you intend to move to New Hampshire, that's close enough to domicile. Um, so anybody who were to sign a free state project commitment to move, who intends to live in a community, has the ability to go out, register to vote, vote there. And honestly, I mean, I encourage people to sign up anyway because I've had people say, well, I signed up 10 years ago, my life has changed, blah, 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 Mr. Borland over there. And, um, and they're like, what's gonna happen if I like, don't come? And I'm like, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna get our cops and we're gonna get our like battens and we're gonna come with our bags and we're gonna rendition you to Syria and beat the crap out of you. Nothing is gonna happen to you. If you promise something now, it's a pledge. If you pledge now and life changes, we all get that. But the support will mean a lot to us because if we can trigger the move in the next two years, we can get that next influx of people who can come and who can you know, be enthusiastic, do the front lines, help run the campaigns, and do all of those things. And then I can write my book, because I'd like to retire. So let's trigger that move. I'm one of those old people. <laughs> uh, but what I wanted to really uh, address is uh, civil disobedience. And uh, the kinds of civil obedience, disobedience you talked about were, I think, very acceptable and very neat. Uh, we see evidence of civil disobedience all over the world in, in very destructive, huge throngs of people causing all kinds of destruction. And I hope we never let our civil disobedience get into that. And in our US, we have years of experience of unionism and its destruction. And uh, I wouldn't want to get tagged with those kinds of civil disobedience as an organization. Uh, and I th I'm really glad you raised that point because I, I know sometimes, and I, I, and I think within this, you know, the Atlas Society, we sort of have uh, cred as, oh, we're the anarchists. And I think people get confused about what that means. Um, we believe in property rights. No one would, you know, if you're referring to like riots that we've seen in Spain or in Turkey or, you know, all over the world where it's, you know, sort of, black block and people you know are destroying private property i think one of the things that makes what we're trying to do in new hampshire unique is everyone's coming from a philosophical property rights position and so even with civil disobedience i mean we've had situations where uh we actually there was a 420 rally at, at liberty forum one year and it was a beautiful spring day and there were probably a hundred of us out there and people were smoking weed. It was just, you know, it was kind of like cool hippie shit. And, um, and there, was a, there was some neighborhood kids came in and there was a, a black kid and suddenly like two undercover cops jump up and arrest the one black kid. And we were all like, what? We've been here for like two hours and you didn't do anything, you racist. And it became this huge thing because a bunch of us were open carrying. You know, we assert our gun rights there. I think it's an important thing to do. And it ended up where we had 11 squad cars came in from, you know, all the southern towns and they had police with police dogs and we weren't all we were doing is saying do, like why are you arresting this kid like this is not right like either arrest all of us or let him go right and um and a police officer came and there's there is a youtube video on this and you know it was it, it was kind of it seemed like it was going to get tense you know and the cop goes he's got a gun and someone in the crowd goes, we've all got guns, so do you. <laughs> and it was like, okay, maybe we'll just all go our own way. <laughs> so, you know, I think that people are quite cognizant of doing it the right way. Of course, freedom is messy. You never know. Someone might do something stupid. But I like to think that what we're building is a, is a community that even in, 
in civil disobedience can, can do it right and sort of shine that light and be more, you know, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King than, you know, street thugs, because that's not what we're about. All right, so um, I will see you guys outside. Thank you very much.